Um, I'm just going through. So the first question is, now this is from Marianne, and I'm assuming this would have been aimed at Richard. So we can answer it, and then Richard might be able to pick up on all the things we got wrong tomorrow. But Marianne is asking, can you explain the differences and benefits between MCT oil and exogenous ketones? So do you want to go first or me first? It's up to you, Dr. I don't mind. Whatever. I'm, you know, you're, you're, you're the host. Why don't you kick us off? Okay, right. So let's look, let's look at the terminology. MCT oil, just for those that want to know, it's a medium-chain triglyceride. Um, a lot of things in this way of eating, people talk about short chain fatty acids, they talk about omega 3s, they talk about EPA, DHA. And it's, there's a lot of things to do with carbons and things like that. But basically, the chain, the length of the chain is what we're talking about here. So, a medium chain is exactly as we think it's a medium chain. Where does it come from, the oil? It normally derives from coconut or palm kernel oil, right? So, that's what a medium chain triglyceride oil is is now uh, one of the things that richard often mentions is although it's from a coconut it's not plant-based because it's sort of distilled i can't remember the actual expression he make he's, he uses well so so we're looking at something that's der a derivative of coconut which is just a, a medium chain triglyceride a three glycerides uh, so one glyceride, three, three, and three fatty acids. Okay. Exogenous ketones are normally in beta hydroxybutyrate or ketone esters. So they're completely different. Uh, MCT oil is metabolized by the liver and it's a rapid energy source. Exogenous ketones directly elevate your blood ketone levels, mimicking a state of ketosis. So that's that's it in a nutshell. So, um, there is probably a little bit more. Um, I know from uh, a little bit of two in a frame, Richard and I have been doing about somebody picking up on what Richard said last week, even though we got plenty of evidence, they can't really quite believe that MCT oil stimulates the body's natural production of ketones. Exogenous ketones obviously provide the body with ready-made ketones and it has an effect on fat burning. The, the thing that is very very ironic is all of this was covered in a 90 second clip by Ben Bickman, which backed up absolutely everything that Richard was saying in a little sound bite. So I sent him that and the studies as well. So, uh, Dr. Epps, did you want to add anything or do you feel we've covered it? I think you've pretty much covered it. I mean, you know, that they're both just methods of trying to enhance the ketone levels in the body, um, while trying to exhibit certain health benefits. And that's, the, the point of using them is the same. The source is slightly different. So the MCT is trying to encourage the natural production of ketones through metabolizing medium chain fatty acids. Whereas the ket exogenous ketones, they are the direct infusion of them. You're not trying to produce them, you're giving the end result directly through supplementation. So you get a sort of instantaneous raising of ketone levels. And when you, when you use MCT oil, you are encouraging the body to make this stuff right you're poking the fire and the fire is burning with exogenous ketones you're bringing another fire so your one dies down a little bit you don't need that anymore so when you are giving ketones to the body it thinks well this stuff i'm trying to make is already here i can relax and it's the same principle as when you give someone testosterone replacement therapy one of the risks you have to talk about is hypogonadism so the testicles shrink and it's it makes perfect sense Testicles make this stuff called testosterone and they sense when there's not enough, so they make more. You shove a load of stuff that's in there, you know, but by yourself with from a syringe, they look around and go, bloody hell, that's there's there's loads there. Let's just take a break. We've done too much work here. And so they they go down. And so ketones can make your body stop producing them. MCT or makes it produce them. So that's a really big difference between them. Uh and also the MCT oil, MCT oil, MCT oil, you've got to remember it takes time to produce and go up. Whereas ketones are just immediate. And when I say immediate, I'm talking literally within five minutes, your blood, a serum level of ketones goes up very, very, very quick. Um, and, you know, MCT oil as well, another good difference is that that's used, uh, I, I, my view, it's best used as, as a dietary fat, like I said, to help ongoing ketone production and also to provide sustained energy. Whereas ketones are, like I said, rapid ketosis and, and more for quick energy boost, I personally feel, um, as well as things like physical performance, cognitive performance. So if any of you are students, you've got exams coming up, 
might be a good idea to take this maybe like 45 minutes to an hour before the exam, depending on the, on the brand that you use to, to help a cognitive benefit as well. Um, and then the MCT oil, that can help us oxidize fat. Uh, now, when I say oxidize, I don't mean make things worse. Like, you know, shopping trolleys oxidize, they, that's, that's rust. Um, when DNA oxidizes, it means it's, it's being damaged. But fat, when we say the fat is being oxidized, what we mean is being burnt for fuel. So it helps us, you know, promote fat burning and, and therefore ketogenesis. Whereas the exogenous ketones, they don't necessarily promote the burning of fat, which is fat oxidation to be technical. They're really just a direct source for energy. That's all. Um, so I think, yeah, I've kind of listed quite a few differences. I think you've kind of lift, listed quite a few similarities together. Hopefully that's a good layman's uh, answer. That's a great answer. Um, right. So I'm just going to thank Rewi Rob. Great to see Dr. Abs live again. Also, failure to hit the like button will earn you one hour's detention. This sounds a bit like a bark cave. I'm just about to say that. <laughs> thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Yes, he's, he's a fabulous person. Uh, right. Okay. Question. Now, uh, just a great tip. If you've, you've got a question, I like these people that put QQQ in front of the uh, comment because it's easy for me to find. Uh, can carnivore help with congestive heart failure? I mean, congestive heart failure, for those that don't know, I'm going to do the layman's bit. Dr. Abs can dive in. Is 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 a chronic progressive condition. I'm not going to say that you can't reverse it, uh, where the heart muscle doesn't pump the blood as effectively, efficiently as you would like. All right, so that's that's what we're talking about. Um, did you want to dive in, Doctor Abs? I think I think you've answered it here the nail on the head. You know, you said what it is, um, but you have to understand the fact that it can be caused by lots of different types of underlying conditions, such as coronary artery disease, hypertension. In layman's terms, high blood pressure, things like cardiomyopathy, etc. So it's not that you're trying to help congestive heart failure. The ideal perspective is what is the root cause? Mm -hmm. And carnivore diets can address root causes. Um, so in in that sense, yes. Absolutely. The environment. This is one of the things that I will say to everybody that's asking questions. Uh, does it help XYZ condition? Normally, I will start with saying it gives your body the best chance. Yeah, because we can't we can't do cause and effect. We can't say it's going to treat this, going to treat that. There's not enough studies to do that. We can work on experience, and we can work around. Well, what is causing it, and go from there. So that's great. Uh, this one from Gaza. Now, I actually know about this, but I, I don't know if you want to talk about it. I'll put it on. Has the miscreant threat trying to force you to only be called Mr. Abs, not <laughs> Dr. Abs, been neutralized? Do you want to talk I, about this? Or yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah. So this this guy just sent me an email um, saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to report you to the dental council, the medical council, the NHS, the police, the consumer transcenders board, because... You've got a doctor title, but you but you got it without doing a PhD. And I was like, yeah, like most doctors in the world, essentially. Um, but you know, nothing's happened, and I've actually been told through representation that nothing would happen because it's it's just a farce. So <laughs> I think he's just wasted his time. Uh, yeah, and I actually watched that video with my jaw drops because. <laughs> So much misinformation in someone wanting to report you for misinformation. It's, it's, it's yeah. incredible. Uh, uh, every week, guys, we deal with this sort of stuff um, where people just just don't know what they're talking about. It really is that simple. Yeah. Uh, right. Now, I've got a question here, which is which I'd like you to read, actually. Yeah, sure. Because you might know what she's trying to, or they are trying to ask. Yeah. Is it the one in blue? Is that the one? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll put it on the screen so, as well. Yeah. So it's uh, it says, I am 24 years old. Can I use tretinoin 0.025% cream on my face daily? Uh, of course, one to two times a week at start uh, or to start with, and then gradually building up to daily application, even though my skin's flawless and bright. So can I dive in? Can I dive in? Please, 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 please. Right. Yeah, of course you can. Because I want to share this. Uh, my skin is very wrinkly. Okay. And I didn't know about it. <laughs> I didn't know about this compound. I'm 16, yeah. right? And uh, at 23, my GP, she said, your skin is particularly wrinkly for your age. Um, 
and I said, well, it's, I, I think it's stress. I think everybody knows I lost my parents when I was really young. I lost a girlfriend to breast cancer. And they prescribed me retinol A. Right. Now, we're talking about a compound which is more effective, I think. But that's my yeah, idea. Having been there, okay. It's spot on. You're absolutely spot on. It is, it is a compound. Tretinoin, for those of you that are you know, not understanding the question, essentially they're saying, can I use a cream to improve the quality of my skin? That's what they're asking. And this cream, tretinoin, tretinoin is a form of vitamin A. Vitamin A is an umbrella term, and we, that term is retinoids, R-E-T-I-N-O-I-D-S. And that encompasses the, from the fact that it's got the letter S on the end, it's a plural because it encompasses lots of individual terms. You probably heard of if you went to Boots or something like that or whatever chemist you have in your country, you'll find things like retinols, retinol products. That's a form of vitamin A. That's why it's called retin and then O-L. So retin means it's it's a retinoid, i.e. it's a form of vitamin A. And ol means it's an alcohol. Okay, so on the 15th carbon of the, this is getting Richard level technical now, but on the 15th <laughs> on the fifteenth carbon of the molecule, there is a hydroxyl group, which is oxygen and hydrogen. That makes it an alcohol. If we were to change that for something else, say to a carboxylic group, it would become retinoic acid, which is what this is, tretinoin. So they have the same base. They just have the different, slightly different suffix on the molecule in terms of chemistry. That makes it retinol, retinal, retinoic acid, etc. This is just a more uh, sort of biologically potent form of vitamin A, uh, essentially. So when you go to a shop and you buy retinol, I hate to break it to you, but you're buying something that's pretty weak, frankly, relative to the spectrum of vitamin A that is available. So when you use tretinoin, you are basically using retinol on steroids. Okay, and it's not literally that, but in layman's terms, I'm trying to make it simple to understand. There's a much, much stronger vitamin A. So in the same space of time, you get much more improvement. The downside is, downside is the first time you use this, your skin is going to need to get used to it. Just like the first time you go to the gym, you're going to feel shot for like a week. And it's not because the gym's bad for you. It's just because you've never done it before. So you you break your muscle and, it's, and your body has to learn to recover. So first time you use this strength of vitamin A on your face, you're going to feel worse. You're going to go red. You're going to get flaky. You're going to go dry. Your skin's going to peel. You're going to hate it. You're going to hate me. You're going to hate Steven. You're going to hate this channel. You're going to hate everything. But it's only once for the rest of your life. Once your skin then adapts, you never have to go through it again. And you get really, really fantastic skin. So once, two times a week is pretty decent. Um, I can't recommend to you individually one to two because I've never seen your skin before. I need to do a consultation. But on average, that's not a bad idea. Uh, I have just put a video out on my channel literally about two and a bit hours ago uh, about how to erase literally every wrinkle. And I'm not exaggerating when I say literally every wrinkle because there is actual photographic proof in the video that you can do that if that's something you're interested. And that's even stronger than uh, than tretinoin. Yeah, and uh, one of the things I've been playing with is trying to get the lighting better because uh, many people don't think that I have wrinkles, you know, and I do. I don't I don't actually hide that. I try to make the light as natural as possible. But on YouTube, you know, if, if I have natural light, it looks really dark. So not my skin. I mean, the... the, the the whole place looks very dark, so I have. Even actually, he uses it. Uh, he uses a filter, but he doesn't want to admit it. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so, carnival muscle here, Jonathan. Jonathan how are you doing, my friend? Nice to see you. Yeah. So, Doctor Abs, any thoughts on GHKCU, NAD plus, uh, injectable, injectable ATP, which is great, and various new uh, can. Can have been a no, it's, it's been a long day for pain relief. So I think that is a that's a peptide, a copper based peptide at the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'll let you I'll let you answer. Sure. Um, that sort of question, Jonathan. Good to see you, my friend. Um, so I'll talk through those individually. So GHKCU for those that don't know, the CU um, is is technically a capital C and lowercase U. It's just a chemical representation of the element copper. GHK. Is that form of copper. Now, GHK is not the shorthand of a molecule. G, H, and K are singular letter representations of amino acids. So that would be G is glycine, H is histidine, K is lysine. You're testing me now. Mm. So that would yeah. be <laughs> that would be glycyl L histidyl, glycyl L histidyl L lysine copper. That's mm. the full name of that molecule. That is something that we find in skincare, for example, the ordinary have that, uh, niode, N-I-O-D, they have that. It's a bit that's used during the, the process of making collagen, essentially. 
it was first brought to light, I believe, in 1973 by uh, Pick, Lauren Picard, I think. Picard 1973 is the reference. Um, it's not a reference I have to pull out so often, so I might be wrong on that, but someone can Google it. And it basically shows that if you use that, you get some benefit in, in extra collagen, which I don't disagree with. I'm sure you would. But there are more basic things to look at than that. For example, if you if you look at that video I just posted, uh, how to you know, remove every wrinkle, you'll find something even stronger than GHK copper. So overall, good, no harm, no risk, absolutely fine. A little bit expensive, but better is available. Uh, NAD plus, yeah, this is something I've got a lot of experience with. Uh, I am probably, in terms of the team I'm in, the biggest user of NAD plus in the world right now in terms of how much we we go through. It's a phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal treatment. Okay, let me tell you a little story. It won't take long, just 30 seconds or so. First started being used in Mexico in the 1990s for people who had alcohol-induced liver toxicity. These were people who were basically signing their will because they were a goner. Suddenly, they were given this IV of NAD plus to try. Five days, they were walking around, jumping like nothing was wrong, and you couldn't tell they were on their deathbed earlier. That is the miracle of this molecule. It has a great safety profile if used properly and appropriately, just like anything, but it can work miracles. The issue is that people get carried away. So in the body, we have NAD plus and we have NADH, okay? The oxidized and the reduced form. It always exists in a ratio, just like the ratio between ADP and ATP, just like the ratio between oxidized and reduced vitamin C. Everything in the body that has an oxidized and a reduced form exists in a ratio in what we call a homeostatic window, just like temperature and pH slash acidity and, and water content and ion content. Everything's in a window for a good reason. NAD plus and NADH are in certain balances. You just shove loads and loads and loads of, of one in, you're shifting that ratio possibly a bit too much. This is something that I've, I've come to realize over time. This is something that I have spoken to Bart about, Bart K, his lordship. And uh, I think he agrees with me on this, that the redox potential ratios, which is what that is, the ratio between oxidized and reduced forms, is something to worry about. So it can be incredible, but it can cause uh, things like pain, inflammation, chronic fatigue issues if you misuse it. So in my opinion, it's something to see someone about before you start using it. For yourself, Jonathan, you're clearly someone who is very active, you exercise regularly, you're probably going to be fine. Um, but it's still something that uh, you would just need to double check first. I'm happy to chat to you privately. Please, uh, you know, we've got each other's numbers, not a problem at all. Injectable ATP. Now, again, you're distorting the ratios between ATP and ADP in in, in this context. So there's an ox, there's, you know, a, a, another homeostatic window between ATP and other molecules. You start to distort that too much and you could end up with issues. What I would suggest is instead of trying to focus on injectable ATP, you simply focus on the entire apparatus required to use ATP. It's like, you know, you've got an engine and a gearbox. That gearbox is only designed to take a certain amount of spinning force, torque, going through it. You shove, you swap that engine out for a huge one, suddenly this gearbox can only put up with a certain amount of force going through it. It's just going to break if you put too much. And if you translate that to what I'm saying here, that as an analogy, your apparatus is designed to put up with a certain amount of ATP. You shove a load more ATP in, what it what is the risk of that? I wouldn't go fiddling with such a crucial molecule personally, uh, but that's just my view. I'm sure other people will, will think differently as well. Cannabinoids for pain relief. I've heard anecdotal evidence that that can help. However, for me, if someone needs pain relief, what is it they need pain relief for? What's causing that? I think that's the most important thing. Because uh, if you use cannabinoids and it's helping, but the pain is still coming, you haven't actually treated the root cause. You're just doing symptom relief, which might be fine in certain instances. But it's more important to figure out what situation that pain is arising from. And then, you know, look at things like therapeutic carnivore diets and looking at medical histories, medications that are on, et cetera, et cetera. But cannabinoids specifically, no personal experience, some anecdotal evidence that I've seen, no hard scientific data that I've seen. Fantastic answer. That's a really great answer. And um, I just want to thank uh, Marilyn, uh, Marianne sorry, for the super chat. And she's saying thank you for the great replies. Now, this is a very interesting one, really, because it's something I would like you to have a look at because I can't do anything about this question whatsoever. And I would be very interested in 
how you would answer this because I'm going to just explain that Richard and I are not doctors, all right? Uh, I have a, an honours degree in physiology and health sciences. I'm a specialist practitioner in obesity and diabetes and a phlebotomist. I cannot take anyone off any prescriptions or put people on prescriptions, all right? So uh, do you want to read that question, Dr. Abs, and then answer how you, as a doctor, also might have a problem because it's not a, uh, you know, a one-to-one relationship? Yeah, of course. So this person has been on the carnivore diet since the start of this year. Yeah. Can they come off uh, lisinopril, bisoprolol, aspirin, tisagrolol, and my blood pressure is good, and I am at no risk of being diabetic, never smoked either. Okay, so I think to start with, me and Stephen would actually say the same thing, which is we do not know the entirety of your history. I know you've given us some drugs, but we haven't consulted you. We don't know the full story. We haven't done any tests, so we are only speaking in general principles. Um, and I hope you appreciate that. You know, we 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 don't, we don't want you to to be unsafe, so we can only speak generally. Now, um, lisinopril is what we is what called an ACE inhibitor. It's an angiotensin converting enzyme, and it's something used to treat high blood pressure. And we've also got what was the other one that she said? I lost a thing now. It's on the screen. Uh, Okay, one second. There we go. Okay, yes, bisoprolol, aspirin, tisagrolol. Okay, so if the blood pressure is good, then is it good because you're on that medication? In which case, if you come off that medication, is it then going to go out of whack again? And that's why we have to look at diet as well. You know, for example, bisoprolol is a um, beta blocker. Anything that ends with that suffix in the word. Uh, bisoprolol, propanolol, etc. These are beta blockers. So they're primarily used to manage cardiovascular conditions like, for example, in this case, high blood pressure. Sometimes they're used for things like angina, just chest pain and heart failure. Now, I don't know if you've specifically had angina or you're at risk of angina or something like that. And without knowing those risks and those other comorbidities, it, I'm, I'm really sorry, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but it is impossible to say yes or no to that question. Um, can they book you for coaching and can they book you for consultations? Theoretically, they could. But the thing with that is I would need quite a lot of data. And if you've been to hospital, sometimes, you know, I'm sorry to say, but depending on which hospital, it's sometimes not easy to get a hold of your notes. Mm. However, I think you and I, Stephen, would both agree, regardless of what that data says, I think we still know what the best diet would be. And so it doesn't change our view on what you should be eating in terms of coming off the meds. Theoretically, you, you could come see me, but I would need a heck of a lot of information of all the notes that you've had from all the people that you've seen so far. Um, yeah. But honestly, I, I don't know if it'll be worth your money. I'm going to be really honest with you. As, as much as I would love to, to earn a living, realize that it doesn't change what you do. It doesn't change that you, you're eating a particular diet that we know is low inflammatory. It doesn't change that we, we want you to make sure you have enough sunshine. That sunshine is really important for nitric oxide in the yeah. skin, for cardiovascular health, as well as other things like even serotonin production, as well as vitamin D production. It doesn't change the fact that you try and be as active as you can. It doesn't change the fact that you try and get you know relatively good amounts of water in the day, that you maybe block blue light at night, all these sorts of things that we all know, none of them change ever. And mm. so... You have to question, is it worth seeing me when you're not going to get any new information of, in terms of what the best thing to do is? Once you have done that for a relatively long period of time, let's say six months, then you can probably think in, uh, along the lines of, can I come off the medication? Uh, and you know, someone like that can, can potentially help you or whoever you're seeing already can help you as well. That's a great answer. I mean, one of the things I try to get to people in a real layman's terms, and it is very broad, this statement, is there is a big difference, for instance, between medications and supplements. So medications yeah. sort of interfere. This is for Amanda and, and, and anyone, else, anyone else interested in why we don't give uh, sort of that one-to-one -one advice. A medication will interfere and it will stop a symptom. That's what it's doing. It's not fixing the part of your body it is interfering and stopping the symptom. And I can't, I can't stress that enough. So if you've got high blood pressure, yes, you can have a medication that will lower blood pressure. But what caused high blood pressure in the first place? That is not what the medication is designed to do. It's not meant to do that, right? So uh, 
that's a very reductive way of looking at it. Now, what's a supplement? Well, a supplement is exactly that. You have a deficiency alleged of something and you supplement. So uh, iodine is my sort of pet, not pet peeve, but it's my pet thing that I talk about. It's really difficult for the lay person to know they've got an iodine deficiency. The easiest way to learn out, learn whether they have or not normally is to take a couple of drops and see if it makes a difference. And you can sort of join the dots and think, well, I might have been deficient. You can do a blood test. You can do an iodine clearance test and you can find out if you are deficient. Uh, but you will also then get confounders. I will have at least once a month someone saying, how can I be deficient? I eat loads of fish. I eat loads of iodine sources. So it isn't iodine, is it? It's the absorption of iodine or the um, the way iodine is converted to iodide, what happens in the functional unit of the thyroid. So there are so many different factors, which is why Dr. Abs is saying we need tons of data. And even yeah. with tons of data, you know, I've got blood, so I've got 150 different biomarkers on, and we're still scratching our head saying, uh, the, the yeah. most perfect example actually is 150. I had this the other day, well, woman, check, 150, every single thing was in range. And I went, how do you feel? She said, terrible. Right. Uh, so the bloods told you nothing, told you nothing yeah. other than she shouldn't feel terrible, but she did. So uh, I just want people to think we're not just uh, passing the buck. It's actually yeah. legal legal as well. We can't say anything. So Yeah, I completely agree with you. Everything you said. I'll give you a, I'll give you a specific example to direct to Amanda. You know, one of the men medications you mentioned there is um, Tisaglor. I don't know if I've said it right. Different people pronounce it different ways, but... This, this is an antiplatelet medication, okay? And it's used to try and reduce the risk of thrombotic events, okay? So patients that have acute coronary syndromes, these are the sorts of patients that, that we, or even maybe history of heart attacks, myocardial infarctions. These are the sorts of patients that we look at these things for. And it works specifically on a, on a really, really specific receptor. I've probably got this wrong because I don't need to look into this in this level of detail normally. But it, I think it's something like the P2Y12 or P2Y2, something like that receptor. And it, it, and it reversibly binds there. And that inhibits um, the activation, the aggregation of platelets. Ask yourself, do you, did anyone ever tell you you've got a problem with activation and aggrega aggregation of platelets? I don't know, but this goes to tell you exactly a, a real life example of what Stephen's just said. We put these medications in there to interfere with things. We don't necessarily look at the root cause. If the root cause is activation aggregation of platelets, bloody brilliant medication. It's hit the root cause. But is it though? Or is it just interfering? And you know, unfortunately that's that's the way medicine works nowadays. It's a shame, isn't it? Right, we've got the next question. Thank you very much for that, by the way. Uh <laughs> Stephen. Uh, great name, by the way. Uh, any advice for someone with gallstones who wants to do carnivore? I started last week, but only lasted four days. Um, I'm not sure if the gallstones are connected with only lasting four days or whether it's the fact you just found this transition to carnivore difficult. Um, I'm going to just make some assumptions, Stephen, <laughs> uh, take it from here. So gallstones, what are they? They're, they're, you know, It's normally cholesterol or bilirubin or a combination of both that makes the gallstones. doesn't mean those two things are the problem. What it means is the regulation of bile or the regulation of um, that's going on in your kidney, for instance, in your gallbladder and everything, the precipitation is not right, the fluid balance, however you want to look at it, or the usage. So if you've come from low fat, for instance, uh, your bile duct doesn't get to work like it should every single day. It doesn't squeeze and things like that. So when you come over to this way of eating, um, if you go from a standard American diet kind of uh, – uh, vegan, vegetarian, no meat, and you go fully carnivore, wow, that's a big shock to your system. You know, lots more protein than you used to, a lot more fat than you used to, and no carbohydrates whatsoever. And that might be why you only last four days, because it's too much too soon. So you could look at sort of just doing a little bit of a reset and thinking, right, okay, what can I do? And I always say, take one thing out and replace it with one thing. So let's say in the morning, you normally have porridge or oatmeal, take that out and have eggs and bacon. And for the rest of the day, do the same thing that you did. And then the next day, see, so you get on doing that same thing. And after three or four days, oh, this is pretty good. I feel a bit different. Uh, you'd have more energy because I'm having this fatty protein based uh, breakfast. I'm going to change my lunch or I'm going to take out uh, the Coca-Cola 
and just over eight weeks before you know it you'll be fully carnival <laughs> it really is as simple as that but it's not easy and that's that's the next step i think this is where one-to-one coaching really helps and mm. also again without being too boring we need more information Stephen. but um the gallstones is not something that should stop you doing this mm. if you have a pro- if you have a problem with producing bile if any of you are you know are in that camp you can actually use things like ox bile and you kind of take this with your meal to help you know replace the the, the bile that you're not producing Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I thought you were going to do a longer answer there. That's that's a good one. You see, I'm so used to Richard. I I just just about to say that. (laughs) I I just stop and just listen, you know. Uh, Right, here we go. Question. This is from me. It's not from me. Someone called me. Uh, Anyway, right. Uh, Vitamin C. Blood test showed almost no detectable levels of vitamin C. How low is too low? Lion diet over one year. Right. Oh, boy. This question I could really go to town on. How low is too low? How low is when you have a clinical presentation of something that is showing you that you are deficient in vitamin C? Right. So, uh, well, actually, let's go back even one step. Finding your levels of vitamin C in a blood test is not great anyway because the concentration of vitamin C in your blood is not what's happening at the cellular tissue level, which uh, this happens all the time. With many of the things, it gives you a guide. The best guide is, are your gums bleeding? Are you getting all the symptoms of scurvy, for instance? I know I'm saying it with a bit of a, a smile in my uh, voice, but... Um, Vitamin D deficiency is not something I've seen in clinical presentation in anybody eating carnivore, ever. Uh, That does not mean I haven't seen low levels of vitamin C. Uh, Milligrams per deciliter, you're looking at 0.4 to 1.5 is the normal. Right, well, where's that come from? Well, that's that's from somebody eating 45 to 65% carbohydrates. There's yeah. a big problem there because carbohydrates, they compete with the GLUT4 transporter to uh, allow glucose into the cell. It competes with vitamin C. It's the same transport. So um, ranges are sort of irrelevant in this particular example because we need less vitamin C to survive because we're not having that competition with glucose. So the levels don't really work. It's much more about... Uh, first-hand experience with the person and how you present okay and again i'm normally used to richard adding something so we'll move on which is this is is great i'll add something just so no 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 don't worry because this is this is actually for you right so this is working out so good um, with that in mind, AKR has got, hello, doctor. So I was asking you anyway, while doing skincare, how to apply moisturizer, vitamin C serum on skin under beard, as I often keep my beard a bit long. Is it necessary to apply them beneath my beard? So what is going to, I'm going to sound like I'm taking the mic, but I'm not taking the mic. Try and part your beard, you know, a bit like Moses parted the sea and then you got access <laughs> You got a bit of access to the skin. Like imagine you're doing curtains on your head, and you can just get the get the skin there. You can use that to to put things in. Um, that's probably the easiest way. It does not because you don't need any special equipment. There's no special tool. Like it's free. It takes you a few seconds longer, but that's all you need. Excellent. Can you see? Uh, can you see the next question that I've highlighted from Yasmin? Let me have a look. Yes. Okay, so she's that? asking... Because I'm going to mull at the name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's, she's going to be getting Cinecost Performer. Um, she wants to know how much can she have under and around the whole eye. Biologically, there's no limit because at the end of the day, this is made of amino acids and a bit of hyaluronic acid, which isn't long-term and it goes pretty quickly within sort of one to two days. So there is no biological limit. The more you have, it just, it's just the longer it takes to, to go down. Uh, if you're using a needle, which is what I use... Um, probably max, depending on, on the person and how much of the area is that, that needs treating surface area, probably go on average under the eye, something like 0.4 to 0.7 mils, something like that. Uh, upper eyelid, including the, let me take my glasses off for a second, just so I can point very clearly. 
upper eyelid and here, just on the inside of the eye, so all the way around there. Um, that total is probably going to be up to, again, half a mil, something like that. Um, I did use a needle, and that's going to give you a much better result in my personal experience. That's brilliant. Okay. So, um, you're not I'm used to getting through so many questions in this time, time period, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, not certainly not questions that are just not the sort of questions I get, really. Um, Zinc316 says, does carnivore enhance autophagy? Dr. Rabs, what do you think? Oh, sorry, sorry. So thought, yeah, you can answer. <laughs> okay, so, so you have to, first of all, remember, why are you trying to enhance autophagy? Autophagy is a deep, as as uh, yeah, his, the deity Lord Barclay would say, it is a dependent variable. In other words, what you're controlling is the phenotype, which is diet, lifestyle, social connections, exercise, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. I guess that's lifestyle. And everything else within the body that is not under conscious control is going to take care of itself. So autophagy falls under that category of dependent variables. So you should still just carry on doing what you're doing and that will take care of itself. Now, for those who don't know, autology is basically a process that happens inside the cell where we can degrade and, and recycle our own components. Think of it as like IT support coming in and, and you know, repairing things and then going away again. Well, basically, if we've got repair and maintenance of our own stuff, um, if you want a, a Richard level answer, you can, you know, there are aspects of it in terms of the mechanisms of, of autophagy. I was going to attempt this in a Welsh accent, but I'll probably just burst out laughing. <clears throat> but we have nutrient sensing pathways like mTOR, mechanistic target of rapamycin. We have AMPK, which is AMP activated protein kinase. And, you know, they, they can work in this, in this field and AMPK is activated when we have lower energy states. So when we have that lower energy state, it promotes the autophagy by inhibiting the mTOR and then activating a particular pathway within a mitochondria called ULK1, which stands for UNC51 like autophagy activating kinase one. Bit of a mouthful, which is why ULK1 is generally all it's called. Now, when you look at activated during low energy states, what that's referring to in layman's terms is when you're fasting, okay? So when we fast, it seems that we tend to go into this autophagic state, shall we say, but it doesn't mean that you need to be fasting the entire time. Yeah, when, when, when human beings, I, I personally, in my view, are kind of designed to drift in and out of ketosis as meals in our ancestral view uh, and our, through our ancestral lens, shall we say, um, as as meals became more and less available because we don't have Uber Eats all around the place. Um, and then when we eat and we potentially get a bit of a glucose spike or an insulin spike, that then inhibits autophagy because that the you know, breaking the fast breaks mTOR complex one. And and so we we then come out of autophagy. And so hopefully with that kind of picture, which hopefully wasn't too complicated, you understand how much of a dependent variable it is. Because if you just fast, 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 fast all the time, just so that you can have autophagy, that's no longer fasting, that's starvation. Okay, that's why these drugs like Ozempic, Wegov, Manjaro, absolute, can, can I swear on this? No. Or, no, okay, absolute load of, and then imagine a swear word that I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> that's, that's what they are. Because, you know, they're, they're working by starvation. That's what it is. So the danger of being obsessed with autophagy is you just keep on fasting and it's not good for you. So my honest advice, carnivore can enhance autophagy because when we eat, let's say one meal a day, because we don't feel hungry anymore, it will naturally drift us in and out of ketosis and that may help in autophagy, but please only look into it that far. Don't try and force autophagy. Excellent answer there. Um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, we're getting a flood of questions, but the interesting thing for me is because your specialism is dentistry and skin and anti-aging, there's ever such a lot, uh, a lot of questions that 
I only know enough about <laughs> to actually go, yeah, well, here's this person. So uh, <laughs> the next question, if you don't want to read this out, and if you've got some something you can add on that for Francis, what have we got? Me- melanotan one peptide, senes make an implant. Risk. Well, I don't understand what the question means. Senes make an implant. I'm really. I don't understand what that part of the question is actually. Ah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. It's not just me then. No, the middle part of the question doesn't quite make sense to me. Uh, I mean, melanotan. Mel- I'll try and explain what the first part is at least. So. Melanotan 1 peptide, sometimes it's written as MT-1. Um, yeah. I believe that is known as, it's like a af- afamelanotide or something like that. It's it's another name. It's basically just, an, just a, a, a synthetic version of something that occurs naturally, which is, I believe, the alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone or MSH. In fact, me and Richard talked about this earlier today on the podcast. So melanocyte stimulating hormone, and that is known as something that can give you a bit more of a tan, basically. So, Mm -hmm. you know, as, as Richard, I've taken that a lot and now I look like this, which is how we ended up here today. Um, because it stimulates something called melanogenesis, which is Genesis creation, melano, melanin, that's the, the color for the skin. So that's what it is. I mean, I'm happy to describe what that is. I don't know what the middle of it is. Senes make an implant. So I can't really. It is here that the Senes implant is controlled release for formulation of alpha melan melanotide. Yeah. yeah, it is a small cylindrical implant about the size of a grain of rice that is inserted subcutaneously, typically above the anterior supra iliac crest by a trained healthcare professional. I've not. I've. I, I'm going to hold my hands up. I've not seen that implant, so I can't answer no. the question. Okay. Uh, you can do a search on that, Francis. According to this, there is no evidence as, that suggests there is a risk of melan- uh, melanoma. But um, uh, we'll we'll say we don't know enough about it. Yeah. So that's it. Uh, Ange Q is asking: Can we get retinoid at lower percentage without prescription? Yeah, you can buy retinol. Go to a drugstore, get to a chemist. Most of them have, they're pretty terrible, most of them, but they do sell retinols, which are, you know, which are vitamin A. You can go to Amazon, you can buy a vitamin A supplement. Not that I recommend it, but that's that's a retinoid as well. Yep, cool. Okay, nice easy question from Matthew. Uh, what is Dr. Ab's favorite carnival meal? Oh, there is a, a rest, there are two restaurants in London which are just astounding for the quality of steak. One is called Machalayo in Kensington, and one is called Beast in Mayfair. Pretty much any steak on their menu is my favorite. Because, I mean, Machalayo yeah. has this oven to cook the steak. The oven itself is close to 100 grand. That is how technical it is, and honestly, it's one of the best steaks you'll ever have. Wow. Okay. Uh, are you all right with all these very, very sort of narrow questions that were about dental? I'm okay with anything at all. Anything at all. Excellent. Okay. Dr. Ab, what is your opinion of the biological dentistry movement and the IAOMT? Dr. Abs is doing a cross as if <laughs> yeah, I've got the order, but... being approached by uh, a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> but this biological dentistry nonsense is just, um, I've, I had a conversation t- today about, uh, about this with uh, Sylvie from the Real Food Company. Okay. Um, it's just, just nonsense. You know, between biological dentistry, it's just dentistry. You know, they talk about stuff like, I'll give you a really prime example of how to spot the, a word I'm not allowed to say. Mm-hmm. And it begins with S and it ends with T. So it begins with B and ends with T. You can guess what the word is. <laughs> okay, yeah. So they talk about things like when you take a tooth out, you take, before you take the tooth out, you actually extract blood from the patient. Okay. And you get it in a test tube, you spin it around in a centrifuge, you extract certain things from it. And you turn it into like the spongy thing and you put that in the socket meant to help to heal by using your own stuff, shall we say, without being too complex. Now, when you take a tooth out, what the hell do you think is going to come into the socket anyway? Blood. Who has ever had a tooth out with a, with zero drop of blood being spilt? Like the blood is in the socket anyway, but they make it sound like you're doing something special. And at the end of the day, if, you know, let's say you've got a disease, let's say you've got gum disease, okay, you probably statistically speaking, you've probably got diabetes as well. And that's a really common uh, reason for people getting teeth out, gum disease. 
you got gum disease, systemically, you're probably not going to be very good in, in terms of health as well. You know, this Western price for me, he's one of the first people to look into this. And if your systemic health is not great, let's be honest, your blood probably is not going to be great as well in terms of quality. So if you take something of low quality, doesn't matter what you do to it, you can try and polish a turd and roll it in glitter, but it's still a turd. You take that, <laughs> you, t- you make a turd sponge out of it, and then you put it in the mouth. It's still a turd, even if it's turned into a fancy sponge that you ch- charge an extra 500 pounds for. So what benefit is there? Like if your blood is not good quality and you've got a systemic condition, why use something not good quality to try and improve the healing on something? It's it's utter nonsense. Um, most of that movement is just the ramblings of marketeers, and that's all it is, you know? Cool. Yeah, so you, uh, you're you going to be a bit wish, wishy-washy with your thoughts here, right? So <laughs> now, Shooting from the hip, this is what we like. Uh, Gemma's asking, what are your thoughts on NAC? I've seen a lot of good, which encourages me to add it into my supplement regime, but also a lot of bad recently, especially relating to turbo cancers. Just for people, it's a pre... I'm going to do a little layman's and then we'll let Dr. Abs answer because, he, you know, he has lit up the uh, live chat with lots of questions. So people don't want to hear from me, but NAC is basically a precursor to glutathione. So anyway. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought you were going to talk. Long time. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it's, it's a precursor. It's basically a supplement form of cysteine, right? And hence why it's called acetylcysteine. Yeah. It's cysteine with a little bit of an attachment on the end. That's all it is. And, and cysteine is, if you want to learn more about amino acids, there is a video on my channel called Amino Acid Biochemistry 101. Let's do all the amino acids, you know, like an introductory lecture and what they can do, how they're made, the, the structure of them. And cysteine, you know, is one of them that's in there. And it's it's valued as as being, let's say, an antioxidant, uh, like Stephen said, precursor to glutathione, all that kind of stuff. Essentially, it's providing cysteine to make glutathione, and glutathione is then the potent acid, oxid, uh, the, the antioxidant that we need, and that then tries to protect the cells from oxidative damage. It can be used to change the reduced form of vitamin C, dehydroscorbic acid, into the oxidized form, which is um, the uh, ascorbic acid. It can help detoxification in the liver, blah, 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 blah. Um, there's lots of different things. However, what about the gastrointestinal issues? What about the nausea, what about the vomiting, what about the diarrhea, what about abdominal pain? You know, as far as I'm aware, and I could be wrong on this, so I, I take it back if I am wrong, but I think there have been reported cases of allergic reactions uh, in terms of things like rashes and the start of breathing difficulties, at least as well. I may be getting this mixed up with another molecule, but I think there have been reported allergic reactions. Um, and long term, what about the mineral levels? What about things like zinc and copper? And what, what about the interference with things like blood clotting as well? At the end of the day, you're, you're trying to get a specific amino acid in there. You should never be trying to interfere with individual molecules in that way. When it, amino acid is the, is, the, is the building block of protein. On a carnivore diet, we are getting adequate amounts of protein anyway. We don't have to start worrying about individual amino acids. And when, if you watch that video on my channel, the Amino Acid Biochemistry 101, there's so much detail in everything. You realize how intricate the relationship between all 20 are and the ratio between them at all times. Even if you put just one single amino acid in because you think it has this benefit or that benefit, that may be the case. It may have those benefits. But you're forgetting the fact that amino acids are the start of a flow chart where they can become so many different things, part of so many different things. And if you start taking a single one, you have no conscious control over what it is specifically used for. Because you might put cysteine in, but if cysteine, you know, if you're in the process of growing lots of new hair for some hypothetical reason, that cysteine could be used for that instead of what you're trying to use it for. You can't shift that out of the way. One advantage of cysteine is that we, 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 it has a, I think it has a sulfhydryl group. You take that hydrogen away and you've got this, this, this uh, sulfur there. And when two cysteines come together, it's, it's like they've, they've clicked like magnets and you get these disulfide bonds and you get pairs of cysteine residues across proteins and, and they click together like this, which means they form this loop. And depending on how they click together, you get certain shapes of the proteins. That's why hair can be curly because of the disulfide bonds evenly spaced apart 
forming clicks that even residues, so you get this curl. How, how do you know the cysteine you take isn't going into that instead of some other process? You have no idea and you have no control. What's better is to focus on a good carnivore diet and not worry about individual amino acids in a long way. answer. No, that's great. We're used to it here. <laughs> we are indeed. Right. We have another question. Now, I'm going to explain to people what happens next. We've got five minutes left, and Dr. Abs and myself will be doing 30 minutes in our school community, which you can join as a member, and I will put the link in the chat, and uh, we will do screenshots of some of your questions, and we'll continue to answer questions. Uh, but you do have to go and join my uh, or, or Richard and I's uh, school community, which Dr. Abs does occasionally appear in, as in tonight. He's going to do 30 minutes extra, which is really great of him. And at some point, I'm going to talk to Dr. Abs about the school community and whether he's going to set one up himself or something. But anyway, uh, I will ask the question he can answer. And in the meantime, I'll do all the necessary admin to get Dr. Abs into that meeting uh, in five minutes over at the school community and to also give you a link if you want to follow on. So Gaz is asking, can the topic testosterone skin treatment be combined with the derma rolling for enhanced effects very interesting uh, you, 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 as you do the admin you just give me a thumbs up when you're ready and then i'll wrap up the answer <clears throat> okay so well, i'm doing that now i'm gonna get the things now no worries so gaz is asking um what is asking is topical testosterone topical just means applied onto the skin directly in this context um, now, I have just released a video about three hours ago, about, like I said, about testosterone eradicating every single wrinkle on people pushing even 90 years old. Um, and I would not combine it with derma rolling because in that research, one of the aspects which allowed that uh, topical testosterone propionate to have such a safety profile is the fact that it never left the skin. It is not, I'm going to really emphasize, it is not for testosterone replacement therapy. It is not for hormone replacement therapy. It is not replacing anything in the body. It is not circulating around the body. It is not doing anything of any magnitude whatsoever to the body. It is only having a local effect on the skin that it is rubbed in. That's all. So if you dermarol and then apply the testosterone, you're potentially then helping it get deeper in and then it could have a systemic effect and that's not what it's for. It's not designed for hormone replacement. Now, could you use it with dermarolling in your life? Yeah, absolutely. But you don't apply it immediately after dermarolling because you don't want it to go further into the skin. So some what you could do is, let's say you're doing a, a six-week program of dermarolling as per my video where you're doing, say, once a week for six weeks. You use the testosterone outside of the dermarolling. So say you're dermarolling, today is a Sunday. Let's say you're dermarolling this evening. You wouldn't put testosterone after. You could have put it on in the morning, so Sunday morning, and morning and evening every other day this week. But on Sunday evening, you only do the dermarolling. And then Monday morning, you go back to normal. Hope that makes sense. And I hope I've landed it just in time for us to switch uh, from here to uh, school. You have, actually. I'm um, just getting all the questions up i just want to show this nice thanks from carnival muscle jonathan cheers for the responsible information it's really good uh it's very, thank you jonathan. very good yeah thank you jonathan you are a very good supporter of what we're doing here which is which is great uh i just want to say to everybody if you're not coming over then look, that's fine. Uh, you can uh, not come over. That's fine. If you are, then the link is in the chat. Uh, I have just sent Dr. Abs an invitation via his WhatsApp, so he should be there. Let me have a look. I can't guarantee that we will answer every question that I am uh, copying because there have been literally hundreds literally hundreds. Um, so we'll get as many as we can done. But what I would say is do join our. Um, our school community because it's it's great fun it's really good fun and you get lots of live question and answer sessions Richard and I are doing one tomorrow at Monday or 8pm so that's tomorrow we always do that as well right I think we're going to leave it here I can't take any more questions over with me but I'll try and do as many as I can and we will see you hopefully over on the members chat and school community but for those on youtube thanks very much for watching i thought dr abs was going to say goodbye then that's why there's a gap but anyway thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> thank you everybody <laughs>